Good afternoon. My name is Polo Camacho, and I'm the program manager here at, uh, at, at Health Ethics Education Promoter here at the Center for Practical Bioethics in Kansas City, Missouri. Welcome to the Center's Caring Conversation Workshop. This webinar workshop is part of the Center's general aim of helping communities identify their goals in healthcare, talk about their healthcare preferences, and ultimately make their healthcare wishes known. As we all know, this past year has been taxing for various reasons. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has claimed many lives and left many individuals fighting for their lives in hospital systems all over the globe. Though it's important we all document exactly how we want to be cared for in case of emergency, it's especially important now as we navigate this global health crisis together. Joining me today is Linda Ward, the former EVP and COO here at the Center for Practical Bioethics. Linda is a distinguished advanced care planning advocate whose work has been recognized nationally and internationally. She has won numerous awards for her efforts. Today, she'll be guiding us on how to have a conversation with our loved ones about our healthcare wishes in case of emergency. So um, Linda, go ahead and take it away. Thanks so much, Polo, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Um, we will work through a series of slides that um, I hope will help guide our conversation and um, be helpful to you in the future if um, you wanna use them with friends, family, or, or any organizations. So hello, let's dive right in and next slide. A little bit about the Center for Practical Bioethics and, and why we do this work. Many of you may be familiar with us, but we are a national leader in bioethics founded in 1984. And the thing that's especially important about any kind of conversation about uh, end of life is having independent, helpful uh, advice. We're not the insurance company, we're not the employer, we're not the hospital, we're a freestanding not-for-profit organization. Our interest is your interest. Um, but we do a lot of work training hospital ethics committees and clinicians, and we can become an, an independent resource. The tagline, on all of our business cards is guidance at the crossroads of decision. Um, and guidance is an important word there. We don't tell you what to think or what to do. We help guide you through a process that will get you to uh, a conclusion that will give you the greatest peace of mind possible. Next. So, so what is Caring Conversations? It's, um, it's a program, it's a workbook, it's a process. Um, and we have um, a workbook on our website that is available to everybody to download. Um, Polo can give you that information later, but um, you, can, you can get it electronically for free. But it's a really a program process for everyone. It um, is especially for those dealing with advanced illness or, response or, or those who are responsible for a loved one. And there are really four components of our Caring Conversations program here. One is consultation and coaching. We are happy to take your phone call. We are happy to talk with your loved one. We're happy to provide uh, help if you need it. And we're happy to be advocates if, if that becomes necessary, if you're having difficulty in, in um, a, a care setting. Uh, we've been, we have lots of relationships with lots of hospitals and um, have been able to be helpful um, in, in um, many cases over the, the decades. And next slide, the other pieces of, of this is relevant information about resources to help you um, sort out these situations and then educational programs like this one uh, about advanced care planning and most of that is simply about getting clear on your own goals and values and making sure your healthcare preferences are known and honored. Um, almost everybody comes to this class worried about somebody else that they're trying to take care of. And if you walk away with anything today, I want you to walk away knowing the most important person you need to think this through for is you. And once you have done that work, you're in a much stronger position to help um, others you love and care about. Next. So we know from experience that having the opportunity to reflect before there is a crisis can really make a crucial difference. We see families torn apart by disagreements over what mom would have wanted. 
Um, and, and the flip side, if you do the work, is the peaceful, dignified end we all want for ourselves and those we love. Nobody wants their death to be the reason the family doesn't gather for Thanksgiving anymore. And um, there's, this is the most important kind of decision making a family ever has to make. And, um, and it, has, it has consequences. And we, we hear story after story where sister isn't speaking to brother because they just disagreed on what mom would have wanted. Mom was on a ventilator, couldn't speak. A decision was made and one of the two will never get over it because there was no real understanding of what mom would have wanted, a, a missed opportunity. Next. So the advanced care planning conundrum is, is pretty clear. People are very reluctant to think or talk about um, serious illness, let alone goals of care and death. Um, the fact that you're on this call speaks volumes about your, um, your maturity as it comes to this subject and how important it is. Um, it's especially difficult when things are going pretty well and people feel pretty well and everybody's doing okay. COVID has brought this into sharp relief for all of us. Everybody's vulnerable right now. But especially when things are going well is exactly the time to have these conversations and to make plans. Um, we really encourage people not to wait until you're seriously ill. Um, nobody's thinking, thinking clearly through taking care of a loved one through a pro prolonged illness, especially in the days where everybody was spending the night in the waiting rooms. That's not happening now because of COVID, but sleep deprived is not the best way to begin this work. So there are a variety of tools to guide you through this process, including this talk. So we'll jump right in. There's some mistaken beliefs um, that uh, you will run into with family members. And this is a famous one. I'll always be able to make my own decisions. I have always made my own decisions and I will always be able to. And the facts just don't bear that out. Um, uh, many people die in a very compromised uh, situation, whether they're intubated or, or medicated or frail. Um, uh, this is simply not true, that you'll always be able to make your own decisions. Next. A um, little supporting evidence for, for my um, confidence in that statement. 85% of us, in fact, will die without capacity to make decisions or on some kind of life support. And it can get complicated. I use this photo. This is a shift change at a teaching hospital. Um, it gets complicated. These, especially now during COVID, everybody's exhausted. Everybody's doing the best they can. Everybody's completely maxed out. But even pre-COVID, um, it's complicated. And we have a rule in our family, nobody goes to the hospital alone. That, of course, has been upended by, by COVID. But um, we know many, many uh, nurses and, and other uh, workers on the floors of hospitals have many, many patients to take care of. And we always have, and when we can, somebody else there to be watching out because it can be complicated. Next. How we die is changing. Um, my my um, grandfather just um, keeled over with a massive heart attack right after breakfast and um, he would have lived longer if he'd lived in the era I've lived in. He would have been on all kinds of drugs for his cardiac issues. Um, but most of us will die now from complications of chronic illnesses and slow and certain um, uncertain disease paths. And dementia is, as all of you know, uh, becoming, a, as the longer we all live, the more it's a potential factor. So how we die is changing. Next. And we know that um, when you check into the hospital, they'll shove an advanced care plan in, or a, a, a document healthcare directive in front of you, say, fill this out. Um, legalistic forms are limited in what they can anticipate and how well they can guide uh, you or your agent. Um, so doing this Caring Conversations project really helps you anticipate some of the what ifs, if you have to think about all of the what ifs, it can seem like an infinite puzzle. Next. So this is a wonderful way to think about um, this, this issue of, of death and dying that I think helps simplify a complicated subject. 
there, there are four basic ways a per person might experience an illness or serious health condition. And number one, I touched about my grandfather and my dad died exactly the same way. This, this is um, maybe even a more abrupt drop. My dad went to bed one night at 73, the same age I am right now, and he did not wake up. Um, his death certificate says arrhythmia, and uh, there were no decisions to be made. They tried to resuscitate him when um, my, my mom uh, awoke and, and found him, uh, but he, he was gone. Um, trajectory number two is one of our dear former colleagues at the Center for Practical Bioethics. Um, um, got a call from him one morning and he said, Linda, I'm going to be late to work. I kind of passed out at breakfast and my wife's making me go to the doctor and I'm going to be late. I'm really sorry. I think this is all completely unnecessary. The next call I got was from his wife saying, please come immediately. And he had been diagnosed with a glioblastoma multiform brain tumor. And um, that was in October and he died in January. So while there were decisions to be made along the way, he went from what we all believe to be perfectly healthy to gone in, in a relatively short time. He and his family did elect the surgery, uh, which may have um, prolonged his life instead of October to January, it could have been October to, to December. Um, but um, this is number two and again, there are not as many decisions that need to be considered in these first two, two um, images. The way most of us are gonna die are trajectory three and four. The, the one on the bottom left is heart, lung kinds of things where you're on drugs, you're on medication, you're exercising or, or your loved one is and you have some kind of event. You get hospitalized, you get treated, propped back up and you come home but you're not quite as good as you were before. And that just goes on over a period of time until a final event. There are many, many decisions to be made along that way. Uh, and, and number four is my sweet mom. Um, the night my dad died, she had difficulty opening the screen door. She was so rattled when the paramedics and I arrived. Um, and within a few months of that time, we learned that she had the beginning stages of dementia and she lived a very long time, uh, gradually dwindling down in terms of capacity. Again, she was very clear with my sister and me. She, um, she sat us down while she still had capacity, but knew the course of this disease and, and laid out some guideposts for us. So um, we, we felt confident every stage of, of her uh, descent uh, in health um, that we were following her wishes. Next. So what we say and what we get are, are different. Um, if, you, if you interview or question people all around the world in all cultures, and a lot of data is available on this, you can look it up. Everybody wants to die pain-free. They want their symptoms managed. They wanna be in their own bed versus to being hooked up to tubes and machines, often in pain in an ICU. They want their wishes honored. They want their wishes known and honored versus the family and um, the care provider being in some kind of dispute. They don't, nobody wants that. Um, and they want the psychosocial needs of the family met versus isolation. Of course, isolation is what, what we're all getting right now with COVID, um, but that's nobody's first choice. Next. So um, I use this permission, the permission of the family, the, the woman in the foreground is a dear, dear, dear friend and supporter, former board chair at the Center for Practical Bioethics. Her cancer returned later in life and she made the decision not to seek uh, any extraordinary treatment. Um, and she is here in her own bed with her dog in her lap, her daughter watching beside her TV program. Her other daughter took the picture and sent it to me and said, Mom wants you to use this in your classes, Linda. Um, surrounded by loved ones, pain managed through hospice, and she died uh, just a few weeks after this picture was taken. The alternate picture is, is the one when a decision is made to call the ambulance, get to the hospital, get admitted to the ICU, um, often isolated from family, even in non-COVID times. And most people shown these two options would pick the one of Joanne every single time. But you have to know what the patient's wishes are 
to have the confidence and the power to act on their behalf if they can't speak for themselves to um, prevent the right side. Next. I, um, I, I want to say an ICU is a fabulous place to be in if you can get better, if there's a path forward. I don't want anybody to think that we don't believe ICUs are an important part of the mix, but they're not a great place to die. COVID-19, um, it's never been more important than right now to have these conversations, not only for yourself, but for everybody you love and care about. And we know this virus is no respecter of persons. Um, and we know that it's been a very difficult time around nursing homes, um, unable to have family close by. And we talk with doctors all the time that are having these conversations by Zoom or a simple phone call uh, while, while the person in, in the nursing home is still able to participate and express their wishes. It's not ideal by phone, but better than nothing. And we know this Caring Conversations program can help. Next. So the next mistaken belief, my family already, already knows my wishes. So this is, a, this is the audience participation portion. I want you to um, think for a second what the last conversation was with the, the loved one closest to you. Just think for a second. If you're like most of us, it's what time will you be home for dinner? Who's going to the grocery store? Do we need to get gas? Um, did you pay the light bill? Um, we do not have deep conversations for the most part. Um, many families have never discussed death or dying unless it was around the death of a loved one, in which case it was probably a, a very difficult uh, conversation and, and was not focused on you, but on your loved one. So um, your family doesn't know your wishes. If you haven't talked about it, people do not know your wishes. So that's what we like to call a mistaken common belief. Next. Family and friends are often unwilling or uncertain agents. I think we all think the person we have in mind who would naturally step in for us, um, you may not wanna take for granted uh, and, and not assume. I, I will um, cite a situation. I was at my desk at the center one day and the phone rang and it was a woman um, sat and, and lots of um, noise in the background. And she said, um, somebody said, you could help me. And um, if my mom put two people on the top line of her advanced directive, who gets to make the decision? And like many questions, um, the first question is not the real question. So I said, I said, well, why don't you tell me what's going on here? And um, again, difficult to hear her, all this clamoring in the background. And she said, well, we're all here in the ICU waiting room. I'm one of 12 children, adults, and um, mom is in the ICU and I'm her primary caregiver. And she asked me to be her, her um, designee on her advanced directive. But I told her, no, I told her, mom, I'm the middle kid. Nobody listens to me. I can't do this. So she said, mom put my oldest brother and my oldest sister both on the top line of her form. And they're the two people you can hear screaming at each other and they never got along. Um, so we kind of took, I took a deep breath. I said, well, tell me about your mom. I said, is she conscious? And she said, oh yeah, she's conscious. And I said, is she able to make decisions? Is she so medicated or does she have a tube or is she able to communicate? Oh yes, absolutely. She's able to communicate. And I said, then nobody, nobody in the waiting room gets to decide for your mom. Your mom gets to decide. Your mom gets to decide as long as she has capacity to decide. So your first job is to get in there with the physician who is her primary um, doctor who knows the most about what's going on with her make sure she knows how sick she is or what her prospects are, what her options are, and then let her decide. And one of the first things she needs to do is name one person to speak for her if she, when she cannot speak for herself, which is not right now, but that needs to be taken care of. So um, it, it's just, it's just emphasizes, I believe, the importance of picking the right person and making sure that the person in the bed um, can, if they can make their own decisions is doing that. And they can only do that with really good information from the medical team. Next. 
Another mistaken belief, my doctor will know what's right. A um, little bit naive in, in this day and age. Um, I actually have a primary care physician that, that I have seen over the last couple of years, but most of my docs have retired. And many people uh, get healthcare in clinics where they see different people every time. Um, and doctors don't round in hospitals anymore. Next, next slide, there's, there's this thing known as hospitalists. Now it's a, uh, a specialty that has been around for many decades now, but there are people who train for medicine who are MDs who just uh, work in hospitals. They don't have a patient, um, a patient group of their own that they see in, in an office. And um, they often have no experience with the patient before them. Um, I, if anybody on this call is old enough to remember Dr. Welby, he, he, was, he was a famous family doc on, on a, a situation uh, program on TV. And of course, if you were in the hospital, he was right there with you. That just doesn't happen anymore. Um, my sister and I were asked by our, our cousin to go to the hospital with our aunt because um, the our cousin who was her caregiver was going to be out of town and she had some routine tests. And so we moved in. Uh, Sandra and I took turns. We, one of us was there the whole weekend with her. And I think we saw nine, maybe nine or 10 different hospitalists because they worked different shifts. And every one of them came in to review her and her chart. Um, seeing her for the first time. So that's why it's important that you have family who can help communicate and can um, be very specific and have the documents to back it up. Dr. Welby isn't coming to visit Andrews. Next. Healthcare systems are, are concerned about legal exposure. This, happened, uh, this happens all the time. Uh, we call it the sun from California. And when we give this talk in California, we call it the sun from New York. But it's the estranged member of the family who hasn't seen mom for decades, but gets the call from the other member of the family who's been taking care of mom, who's been suffering from a variety of, of conditions. And all of a sudden they come flying in when they get the message, mom is dying and start threatening the hospital about do everything, you have to do everything to save mom, I have things to tell her. Um, and um, healthcare systems, when somebody's threatening to sue them, have, have to be concerned about that. It's just a business fact of life. So um, make sure everybody in the family knows what mom, dad, what you have said, so we have no um, no relatives flying in at the last minute, uh, issuing ultimatums um, without good information about what mom really wants next or what you really want. So we talk a lot about in advanced care planning about two, two documents, uh, one that names people to, who to speak for you and the other that a lot of people call a living will um, that has you say what you want and don't want. And the legalistic approach is, is not enough. You, we want you to have those documents. Those documents are included in this workbook that I've um, talked about. But nuance is a big part of, of healthcare. And that's why talking to loved ones is crucial ahead of the crisis. And it's one reason we call this program Caring Conversations, not Caring Documents, because the documents are only a small part, but an important part. Next. So I've written it down so I don't need to talk about it. And often um, nobody can find that document that dad always said he had written it down. And the very worst place it can be is a safety deposit box where the only person with the key or who even knows what bank the, the box is in um, is unconscious. Um, and again, why we call it caring conversations, not caring documents. It, it needs to be written down and discussed and we need to know where to find it. Um, that's just really important. I, uh, there is a hospital not far from me that if I had some, um, some event and was transported there, they've got a copy of my advanced directive on file at that hospital. Um, I'm my sister's durable power of attorney. I carry it in my wallet. Um, it, it's just something we all need to be aware of and figure out how to get our hands on it. Next. This is a shocker to parents of teenagers, 18 and older um, young adults need to identify a healthcare proxy uh, who will make decisions for you in the event you can and how do you decide is not an easy task. 
Um, but anybody 18 and older needs to undertake this work. And the next part that I wanna focus on here is as you think about who you want to speak for you, not all of your family members and friends are created equal when it comes to being good in a crisis. And in the workbook, there's a whole section, a whole page that talks about what's helpful in a, in a proxy and what's not helpful in a proxy. And it's, it's a, and by proxy, I mean a, a designated healthcare, um, just something that might hinder, hinder somebody who might be a perfect um, person in your, in your judgment. But if that person is um, in a very demanding job and can't get off, or if they have their own health problems or they're physically far away, there may be reasons that that perfect person may not be the perfect person. Um, so think, think this through. Next. So earlier conversations, a lot of data about this, um, and you can see the attributions beside these things. A lot of research has been done. Earlier conversations about patient goals and priorities for living with serious illness are associated with all kinds of good things. Enhance this, this um, study calls it goal concordant care. It's simply care that aligns with what you want improve quality of life, reduce suffering, better patient and family coping, higher patient satisfaction in the early days before death, and uh, less non-beneficial care and costs, of course, is, is another good outcome of good planning. Next. So another study, multiple studies show patients with serious medical illnesses, this one focused on cancer that the first end of life decision occurred a median 33 days before death, which is just shocking, I think. 55% um, of initial end of life discussions occurred in the after the person was hospitalized. And only 25% of these discussions were conducted by the patient's oncologist. So we have a lot of work to do in the medical community, uh, helping physicians, um, routinize these conversations in a way that doesn't make them opening the conversation, make the patient immediately think, oh, the doctor thinks I'm dying. Um, one, one physician I worked with through the American Academy of Family Physicians in Wyoming says he just makes this an annual, a part of the annual physical. We drag out the pa his, his patient's advanced directive. We look at it together. We see if anything needs to be updated or changed so it isn't a crisis kind of thing. Um, and now, happily, uh, physicians get reimbursed for doing this. That's relatively new. Next. So some tools to start the conversation. This um, is a photograph of our conversation aid. It's just a little flip book. If you and your family have trouble, um, I mean, think for a second, how much of, of your life, as I mentioned earlier, is around activities of daily living or the TV's on, or the kids are supposed to be doing their homework, or um, it's, not, it's not an environment that is conducive to let's have a really deep conversation. So this little flip book is great. And it has some non-threatening questions in it that, that can just help you get a little deeper than what's for dinner um, with things like, who's been the most influential teacher in your life? Um, you know, if, if you could pick a perfect day, what would it look like? Um, and, it, and then it does have some end of life type questions in it, but you can just flip through it, ask any of the questions that you feel like, and it helps your family get in the habit of talking about something a little deeper than dinner. Next. So the Caring Conversations workbook, I held it up a second ago. I don't think my camera's good enough to really, but it's, it's a very simple um, little 16 page document, but it's in four sections. The first one is doing your own work. Almost everybody starts this from a standpoint of I can't get my dad or my mom to do this, or, but do it for yourself first. So do your own reflection about what a good death looks like to you, what you want for yourself. Um, and then talk about it with potential family members or, or close friends and, um, and kind of see what you think about who would be the best person to name. Then formally appoint that person by acting, by filling out these forms, and then telling anybody who might be in the waiting room who you've named and why. Um, this can be difficult for families, just like the story I told you about the intensive, the intensive care waiting room. Um, 
you just have to, to lean into this and say, you know, this is hard stuff, but guess what? It's the only thing we all absolutely know for sure is going to happen. So let's be adults about this and, and say, you know, who has the proximity? Who knows me well enough? Who's willing? Who will say, I will take this on and be this person for you? Document it. And then I tell people, people say, well, who do I need to give this to? Sometimes um, people make sure their clergy has a, a copy of their of their caring conversations workbook. Uh, some some people want their lawyer to have a copy. Certainly, the hospital they might go to and their their primary care physician, but mostly key family members who are going to have to act uh, on your behalf. Next, so um, this is. Um, a little more about what I was talking about. You've got to examine your own values and beliefs and concerns first. Next. Think about what's important to you and the care you want to receive at the end of life. And I'm going to take a second here to put in a plug for hospice. The number one complaint about hospice is why didn't somebody tell me about these wonderful people sooner? Um, and, and, and it's not the end of the world to engage hospice and have your loved one get better. Loved ones often get better when they're being cared for well and they're being and the family's being cared for as well as the patient. Um, we, we see patients, what we call graduate from hospice, and, and then they have another period of, of life uh, before they actually die. Um, but um, hospice is a godsend. And the, the, the picture that I showed you earlier allowed our dear friend to die at home in her own bed, pain-free, surrounded by her family. Next. Um, this, what does it mean to you and your loved ones to die well? What does a good death look like to you? Some of the questions that you want to think, think about for yourself, document in your workbook, and then share with your family or friends. Next. Talk, talk to loved ones about your wishes and then appoint the person you think is most able to act on your behalf based on your preliminary conversations. And don't be surprised if somebody says, I just could never make that hard decision. And not everybody says, if, if, I, can't, if I can't do this, this or this, I don't want my life prolonged. That's a hard decision. And some people can just honestly say, I couldn't do that. But there, you can you can appoint anybody, and I'll tell you, I was doing a program at one of our big employers here for a group of their retirees, and there was a very quiet woman, didn't ask any questions, sat quietly in the back of the room, and she kind of hung around after everybody left. And um, I I just walked up to her and sat down, and I said, "Thank you for coming. I uh, hope this was helpful." And I said, "Is there anything I can be with?" And she said, "I don't have anybody." And I said, what do you mean you don't have anybody? She said, well, I never married. I'm an only child. My parents were only children. I have no relatives living and I don't have anybody. And I said, I just watched you have lunch, talking it up with all your old friends from the company here. And I said, I said, do you have neighbor? Oh, I have wonderful old colleague friends. I have wonderful neighbors. Do you have a faith community? Oh, yes, I attend my church regularly. And I said, any one of those friends can be your designated person. It doesn't have to be a relative. It just has to be somebody who knows you well and who you're comfortable having this conversation with. Next. So final step of this is acting by documenting your reflections in the workbook. And um, of course, now we are, we are in the digital age. So um, Polo, I'm going to have you talk a little bit about um, our electronic options for this. I think that's the next slide. Go ahead. Okay. Sometimes it gives me a little trouble when I'm trying to talk and uh, go to the next slide, but let me go ahead and attempt this. Well, anyways, uh, while that's sort of warming up, I did want to talk to everyone a little bit about my directives and filling out your advanced directives electronically. Now, as Linda already noted, an advanced directive is basically a way for everybody watching this and beyond to record and document your healthcare wishes in case of an emergency. Um, MyDirectives.com, which the center has an agreement with, um, if you go onto that website, you're able to fill out that form electronically. And uh, what you're able to do is uh, answer a ton of questions about how you wanna be cared for. Everything from, do you want to be fed through a tube? 
to what kind of music do you want to listen to if ever you're, you know, in an ICU setting or a hospital setting, um, down to what's something that you want to say to your loved one, to your wife, to your husband, to your significant other, um, as you're going through this, what's something that you want to remind them of? Um, it's pretty extensive. And what you're able to do is add someone to it. So you can add a friend or whoever your healthcare proxy is, you can add them to that directive. And then an email is sent to them. So if ever something happens, um, they receive an email indicating all of your directives, all of your goals of care. So if something, God forbid, were to happen um, and they end up in the hospital with you, they're able to access that information using their phones, using their computers. They can just pull up your advanced directive. And the cool thing about mydirectives.com is if you fill out this workbook, which as Linda already mentioned, is on our website, www.practicalbioethics.org. You can go on there, go to, go to our Caring Conversations page, download the workbook. You can actually upload the workbook onto my directives. So if you wanted to bypass a lot of the questions on mydirectives.com and just to upload the contents in the workbook, you can do that as well. Thank you. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to uh, move this uh, to the next slide really quick. The slide appears to be frozen, everyone. Let me just go ahead and see what's going on. There we go. So um, this is just a picture of the front back page in the workbook that is the durable power of attorney for healthcare decision making and then the, um, um, the, the treatment directive and um, they're, they're back to back in our workbook so they do have to be signed and notarized and um, they have to be kept back to back so if you pull it out of the book it's already back to back if you focus the book you need to keep these two pages together um, so that you have the one the one notary um, uh, and two witnesses that it requires next so people said, what is an advanced directive? It's really these two documents, the durable power of attorney and the health directive or living well together make an advanced directive. Next. So um, this is the my directive slide that I really hope that you will consider. Um, I think more and more people are going to electronic everything and um, the other thing you can use your phone for is, is have mom just do a video of what's on her heart and mind. And, and I'll tell you, I talked about the son from California. Nothing's more compelling uh, to the son from California with mom unconscious is a video of mom um, saying what her wishes are and, and asking for support of the person that she's named. Next. So people say, oh my gosh, I know you're right, but I can't even imagine doing this. This just makes me uh, very uncomfortable. But use comfortable language. I hope I've communicated this comfortable, down to earth, this is part of life language. Um, just, just take your time with it. And many people come to me saying, I can't get my dad to do this. And I say, have you done your own? Oh no, I'm only 42. Um, do your own work first and, and start the conversation by sharing it with your dad. Often I'd say to these people who are so upset that dad won't talk about it. If you were in a car wreck tomorrow, would dad be in the waiting room, you know, worrying about you? And often they say, absolutely. And I say, well, um, share your work with, with your dad and what you would want. And then say, dad, this is my gift to you. I need the same gift from you do us the honor of thinking through these issues and sharing with us, the family. Next. Um, sometimes these, can, these uh, conversations can be difficult. The woman I showed you in, in the picture before, um, she couldn't get her family to talk about these issues and because nobody wanted to talk about death and dying, of course. So they took the whole family on vacation and she said she she took a copy of a workbook for everybody in the family. All the, the grandkids were at least teenagers, if not 18. And they 
they just locked the doors and said, we're having this conversation together. And she said, we left, we cried, we told stories, we hugged. It was one of the most meaningful family gatherings we have ever had. And, um, and I think about those of you who remember the Forrest Gump movie when mom says dying's a part of life. We just got to get over this feeling that it's never going to happen to us and never going to happen to anybody we care about. Every now and then somebody will call me and say, well, how come there's nothing in your workbook about what funeral home I want? Um, um, we want you to discuss practical issues, but these are all about healthcare. There are all kinds of good resources that help you do other planning, uh, what hymns you want sung at your celebration of life. That's what this is, those other things. Um, other people have done well, we, we don't do those. Um, and, but just sharing psychosocial, spiritual, and religious concerns with your family members. Um, a religious funeral is very important to some people, not to others. Be sure you discuss those issues um, with whoever's gonna be there. Next. So um, sometimes people kind of get stuck on, well, I don't know how big to make the circle on this. So we do a little exercise where I, I would like each one of you to uh, imagine, um, many of you may be working from home or remotely today, but back in the day, we were all climbing in our cars at the end of the work day. And I said, you're on your way home, minding your own business. And in Kansas City, um, you know, we, we do have some mass transport, but almost everybody drives and very few people carpool. So a, a lot of us are alone in our car on our way to and from work. And I say, what if you are driving perfectly, but somebody's texting in an intersection and you get T-boned uh, on your side of the car and you're unconscious at the scene? Um, what happens next? And people are just like, wow, I hadn't even thought of that. So um, I, I, I ask people to think about figure out either from your wallet or your phone or your glove box, what your name is or your card, they're going to figure out who are they going to, who with you unconscious, we're not going to kill anybody off in this scenario, but you are unable to speak for yourself. Who are they going to figure out who to call and how are they going to figure out who to call and what, who are those people, those people that have come fly into the hospital, um, who will that be? That's who you should be having this conversation with. Not, not necessarily naming every one of them, but saying, here's who I've named. I know you would care if I were injured in a car wreck and be in the waiting room. Who, who have you named so they all know who is the decision maker on your behalf? And share, share what you've told them um, so they can be supportive, not, um, not um, unsupportive. Next. So complete your own workbook as a way to start this. Uh, download it from, from our website um, for free. Uh, have a caring conversation with, with two or three people that you love and care about who think you might think of as, as the one you would name. And then name one of them officially, have it signed and notarized. Um, and I would, I would give a caution here too. Nurses will tell you that often people show up with an advanced directive in the hospital and they call that person that's listed and that person had no idea they had been named by the person in the hospital. That's not fair. You owe it to that person to ask them if they would be willing to take that role and to share your thoughts with them. Um, so, and then tell other people that you didn't name. I want you to know I've named Polo and here's why. I love you all and care about you, but I've gone through these factors of what I think will be important. I think he's in the best position to speak to me when I can't speak for myself. And I ask you to provide him your input and your full support. Next. So this is not a one and done process. Um, it's an ongoing process because you can become seriously ill. You can be in an accident. You will decline at some level or you may be near the end of life for any of these life events or signposts along the way. And um, so years ago, April 16th was established as National Healthcare Decisions Day and the Today Show and Good Morning America all picked up on it. And April 16th was chosen because it's right after what? April 15th, file your taxes, update, the other thing that's absolutely for certain in this life. 
death and taxes side by side. It's a good reminder to pull it out, see what it says, see what's changed and um, update it if necessary. Next. I, I want to tell you a quick story to emphasize that last point. Um, I, I was doing a, a, another program and a, a woman was there looking kind of bored and um, uh, we were waiting for the group to assemble. And I said, um, well, thank you for coming. Um, tell me what brings you in. She said, well, I don't even know why I came. She said, I, any easy, reasonable people, pe person has already done this and I did it years ago. And uh, so I don't even need to be here, but I just thought I'd see what you had to say. And then this look kind of came over her face and she said, oh my God, my ex-husband's on that forum and I don't want him making any decisions about me. So things change in your life. That's why April 16th is important. Um, you want to revisit your plans for proxy and goals and um, make sure that um, you look at it annually or every other year at least and see what's changed as your planning becomes more focused. And, and your healthcare provider should be involved. Your, your primary care doc, if you have one, should have a copy. Next. So talk to those close to you, talk to your doctors who can now get reimbursed for having this conversation with you, share your workbook. I tell people just to make a note on the cover of your own workbook, who you gave it to. So when you update it, you'll remember who to give the updated version to. And um, store, store the paper copies where they can be found and or, or put them in the lab through mydirectives.com. Next. So the center is available to help you and your family. The, the main number is listed there. Pose email address, mine, and, and the center website address where you can download the documents are all there. Um, practicalbioethics.org will get you to all this information. And we would love to hear from you. I, I see there are some questions and uh, something in the chat, um, Polo. Yes. So, um, we can move to that. Awesome. So uh, thank you so much, Linda. Now we're gonna go to questions in our chat. Um, so people aren't seeing my email address in the chat. What I'm going to go ahead and do something that I said early on is if you want any access to resources, if you have any questions or even, uh, want to watch this video, once it's been downloaded onto YouTube, feel free to email me. Um, I'll say my email first and then write it in here. It's P Camacho at practicalbioethics.org. Feel free to email me and also Linda. Um, she's on our website as well if you wanted to contact her and ask her any questions, but I'll, uh, if you want the video or any resources related to caring conversations, feel free to call me. I'm going to go ahead and put my email in the chat. All right, there it is, pcamacho at practicalbioethics.org. Um, so there that is, and I see that some of you all posted your emails there. Thank you for that. Um, if, if you want any information, just feel free to email me. And I think we have something in the Q&A. So here we go. If naming a proxy for medical decisions and one for surrogacy, I assume that the former advises the latter with the latter having the final say. That is the, the surrogacy having the final say. I have deliberately, deliberately not named my wife in either of these capacities to spare her the pull the plug decision. However, how to best ensure that her voice is heard other than to state that she should not be consulted in the decision-making process. So I believe this question is asking, how can we ensure, or can someone ensure in their advanced directive that they want their wife's voice to be heard, just not with this specific aspect of the, the pulling the plug scenario? Um, Linda, I'm assuming that uh, they can stipulate that, right? They can say when it comes to this specific. Yeah, position. yeah, you can write. You can write whatever you want. Um, I think, you know, one of the the greatest um, advanced directive advocates of all time didn't fill fill out any of the blanks. He wrote a letter, <clears throat> um, and he just described what he wanted and the role he wanted his family members to play. Um, I think people, people in these life and death, people in the, on the clinical side are just looking for guidance. They're looking, they, the patient's unconscious, can't speak for himself. They're just looking for guidance to make the best decision um, in, in aligning 
um, with with your uh, wishes. So um, there's a lot of leeway. I, I mean, there, if you don't have the official forms, and, and the family's not in a fight about it, and the and the the clinicians and the family members are are of one mind. This isn't a big deal. It's just that it is a big deal many many times because that confluence doesn't happen. So. Um, we don't, we don't want to risk that. So I think you can, you can write, I mean, there, there are parts of the workbook. Some people just cross through and say, I'm not interested in this, or you can do whatever you want. You can say exactly what you just told us about. You don't want your wife to have this burden here. So you, you need to be sure your wife knows. I mean, is this some, if she says, I want that burden, I want to be the one you ought to have that conversation. Um, no surprises, no surprises. And then we have another question. How frequently do you revise a two-sided form? Yeah, we look at it all, every year, of course. And, you know, you can go online. There are advanced directives in every state. I have people call and say, oh, my mom's in Florida. It's work. We have never had this, this document challenged in any place, anywhere it's ever been used um, intergalactically, I don't know how far it's gone, but it's certainly been all through the United States. But if you, and the forms do differ. If you if you look at, at Florida, um, Florida's forms a little different than ours is. But a healthcare provider with our form in their hands in Florida is gonna be grateful for the direction. Great. So we got a thank you from uh, Suzanne Bentley. I, uh, thank you so much. I especially loved your examples that help make things real. Uh, thanks so much, Suzanne, for attending. Um, one, something I want to mention, we have about eight minutes here, we don't have any questions, is though we're talking about caring conversations, um, something that I would encourage everybody that's watching uh, to take away from this at the very least, the fact that what we're trying to do is help you to have a conversation that will ultimately turn into a uh, some way of recording your healthcare wishes in case of an emergency. Um, I know that many of you are probably watching this thinking, well, you know, I don't know how to download the document, or maybe I don't have the document. As Linda said previously, you can record a video. Um, you can have a family member, your sister, your mother, your father, somebody record a video of you stipulating exactly what you want to happen in case of an emergency, in case you fall seriously ill, or in case something really, really bad happens. So one of the takeaways that we want you to have from all of this is have the conversation. Um, don't be afraid to have the conversation. Use comfortable language if you must. Um, though, of course, caring conversations, the workbook isn't the only way of having a caring conversation. There are also things that maybe you didn't think about in case something happens, in case an emergency happens, like a feeding tube, right? This is something that isn't immediately obvious to someone when they're thinking about the end of their lives or when they, they, they fall into a situation like this is being fed through a tube of breathing via the use of a ventilator, of a defibrillator, something that you know brings your heart back or it sends electric pulses into your heart. Uh, these are things that we don't normally think about in sort of everyday speak. And so what the Caring Conversations Workbook can help do if that's something you're interested in is introduce you to those possibilities and say, hey, you know, this is an option. Um, is this something that you would want? Would you want to be fed through a tube? Do you want to breathe through a ventilator if you're severely, severely ill? Um, if doctors say, you know, there's really, this is futile care and putting them on a ventilator isn't really going to do much, is that really something that you want? As Linda already said, ICUs can be a wonderful place if there's hope or a chance of coming out the other end healthy. Um, but if you're in decline and the doctor's recognizing that you're in decline and you don't have capacity, what is it that you would want? And so the Caring Conversations Workbook can introduce you to all those possibilities. Um, and so with that, we have about five more minutes in case anybody wants to- Yeah, I, I, I just wanna to add to that. We get calls from nurses, um, not all the time, but many times over my long tenure at the center, uh, weeping about what they call torturing the dying. And, and to them, somebody's actively dying, but the family continues to insist on all these interventions that are painful. And, uh, you know, we've heard a lot about what it's like to be on a ventilator uh, through COVID. 
not great. Um, if it's a pathway to getting better, that's one thing. If it's if it's torturing, dying, nobody wants that. And nurses um, you know, have all kinds of PTSD over over those where families are insisting on continuing futile care. Um, and, and we don't ever want a doctor to say, there's nothing more we can do for you. You never say there's a, we can keep you comfortable. We can work to keep you comfortable and manage through this. And we have all kinds of capacity as evidenced by our dear colleague uh, in the picture with her in, in, in her own bed. Um, but, you know, there comes a time when enough is enough and, and family members have to be brave enough to, to say, that's it. Yeah, that's a really great uh, point, Linda. Something that I, I you know, want to illustrate through by an example is uh, the other day a family member called me um, telling me about the health status of my adopted grandmother. Um, her name is Erlinda. So Erlinda, if you're watching this, uh, hello. Um, but uh, they uh, called uh, telling me that she had stage four cancer and she was on the decline and that her family members wanted to immediately put her in a hospital and that they wanted to, you know, uh, do the by any means necessary treatment. And I spoke with this family member and I said, you know, what does Erlinda want? Does she want the by all means necessary medical treatment? Or uh, does she know that it's an option for her to be comfortable? And so I actually ended up talking to Erlinda and Erlinda's uh, comment to me was, uh, Mijo, I don't want the by any means necessary treatment. I want to be home. Is there a way for me to stay home? And I wound up sending her material, the Caring Conversations workbook material, and her and her daughters filled that out together. And right now, Adelina's at home, um, watering her plants, making herself food any morning, every morning, and hospice is making periodic visits to her house. So um, that's what we're talking about, right? That's exactly the point that we're trying to make. Comfort measures are possible. A lot of people don't know that. And part of having this caring conversation means, hey, I want those comfort measures if things boil down to it. If the care they're giving me is no longer working and I'm on the decline, keep me comfortable. Uh, so I just wanted to provide that illustration for- Yeah, that, that's, that's real time. And our mind goes out to you and your family going through that. And, and sometimes there's a middle ground. Somebody will say, you know, I'll try one round of this or, or you know, feeding tubes are not without side effects. I mean, there are all, all kinds of problems with feeding tube is not an easy, simple, no, no problem procedure. Um, and, and neither is uh, somebody jumping on your chest, shocking um, your heart um, with, with some kind of extraordinary we hear about, especially for all elderly, broken ribs, punctured lungs. Um, um, my mom was real clear she wanted none of that. And, and my sister and I were um, with her when she died, and she had none of that. She died peacefully in her own bed, pain-free, surrounded by her family. That's beautiful. Um, so let's see. We don't have any more questions. Um, it's about thank you time. all. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'd be very interested in your feedback. If you have stories to share with me, um, lward at practicalbioethics.org. Um, if, if someone said they liked the stories, I, I've learned those stories from people who've shared them uh, with me in, in the cases of ones that haven't been uh, specifically my lived life. Um, so I'd, I'd be grateful for your feedback and, and stories. Yes, and uh, be sure to follow the Center for Practical Bioethics on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, and also LinkedIn for all the latest updates and content related to bioethics, um, our educational webinars, and our public health resources. Uh, as we already mentioned, we have a ton of resources on advanced care planning. We can send you the workbook via PDF. Whatever you need, just reach out to us. We're hosting two more Caring Conversations workshops this fall, one on October 26th and another on November 1. If you want to attend again and maybe ask a question in the future, maybe you're mulling something over, please do attend. Um, or if you want to share the registration link with a friend or family member, all you got to do is go to practicalbioethics.org, click on the events calendar, and then you'll find the registration link um, for the care, under the Caring Conversations header. Uh, once again, uh, thank you so much, Linda. This has been absolutely wonderful. Uh, thanks to all my wonderful colleagues here at the Center for Practical Bioethics. 
you all make this possible. Um, thank you all for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you.